Consultation Network. Of course, we do this every Tuesday at 12.30, so glad you could join us today. We've got a great uh, a thing, I think, for you today, a uh, great, great uh, case, case to discuss. And I hope uh, everybody will, as we're going through this, give your ideas, uh, give your, your notions of what uh, might be helpful in this circumstance. This is a person who has experienced some, a uh, person we're calling Gina today, who has experienced some catatonia uh, and also some manic symptoms, something called Bell's mania that I'll tell you more about in just a little bit. Uh, we have with us today Amy and uh, is it Brittany? Brittany yes. and we are going to have Katie with us here shortly and also my, also my co-host today is going to be Dr. Victor Schuler. So glad we could get him on here today to help us sort through this this uh, case discussion. And uh, of course, our producer is uh, Babs Tiernos. So glad uh, she's here with us today as well. So upcoming on CCN uh, today, we have case consultation next week. We've got Dithu Rajaraman. He's only been in town for, what, about three or four months? And this is already his third time to be on the Clinical Consultation Network. We're so happy to have Dithu here to talk about trauma-informed applied behavior analysis. He's really good at this stuff. Uh, so glad that he's going to be back with us here on December 6th. Uh, on December 13th, we're still working out what we're going to be doing on that date, but it'll be something good, I promise. We'll probably take a couple of weeks off toward the end of the month for uh, some holiday that's coming up. I think uh, it's Christmas, right? I've got my, uh, I've already started wearing my red sweater, trying to get prepared for the Christmas season. So today, uh, we're going to do a case consultation on Gina. Gina has alternating periods of catatonia and manic responding. We're going to review this case and get some additional information from Amy and Brittany and Katie when she gets back. And um, then, uh, as I said, we've got Dr. Victor Schuler here with us today. All right, so I'm going to get us started with today's Get Smarticle. Did you know this was happening, Amy, that we do the Get Smarticle? We, we have a Get Smarticle every week. So it's just an article that we find that kind of addresses something like the issue that we're dealing with in the case consultation. So I'm going to just give a little bit of information, particularly about Bell's mania here, which is one of the diagnoses that Gina has. Uh, this is from an article, Cordero et, et al., and it's uh, titled, When the Bell Rings, Clinical Features of Bell's Mania. Next slide. Oh, boy. This is really small, but this was a case study of a 72-year-old woman with bipolar disorder type 1. Uh, she had also a history of psoriasis, hypertension, obesity, and um, monoclonal gam gamopathy. I can't read it very well there, gamopathy. Uh, 2019, found wandering the streets, speaking incoherently. She's also displaying uh, disorientation. Um, uh, irritable mood, increased energy, sleeplessness, impulsivity, pressured speech. Uh, she's treated in the past with lithium carbonate, more recently stable with valproic acid, uh, sodium valproate, I'm sorry, and fluoxetine, 20 milligrams daily, admitted having stopped the medication about a week before her admission to the hospital where this case study was occurring. Next slide. Medical status during admission. Her, she was admitted to psychiatric hospital and treated with phosphomycin, sodium valproate, catiapine, trazodone. Uh, CT scan revealed moderate, slightly asymmetric cortical, temporal, and frontal atrophy more prominent on the left, unremarkable physical examination, except blood and urinary analysis were compatible with acute renal lesion and urinary tract infection. Keep that in mind. During the early hospitalization days, mood swings between dysphoria and depression were evident. She showed a progressive response to treatment though, and by day eight was euthymic with no changes in consciousness. She was discharged with the following diagnoses, delirium due to urinary tract infection, 
And so one of the things we know about urinary tract infections is that they can often cause this type of delirium. And uh, it's, it can be a very serious condition for a lot of people. Bipolar affective disorder, uh, severe manic, and then episodic amnesia for the period before her admission and it, that it persisted after discharge. Next slide. So a few points of discussion. Bell's mania patients with catatonia shouldn't be treated with antipsychotic medications. This is one of the clear recommendations that uh, Dr. Vaught made in a report that we're going to be talking about for the person, uh, Gina, that we're talking about today. Um, but it's it's not a, a course of treatment that is given for people who experience catatonia. Bell's mania patients without catatonia may use psychotropics. And in this case, this person did not have catatonia, so she was was treated with sodium valproate and catiapine, which is an antipsychotic medication. Death is possible for patients with catatonia and are treated with antipsychotics uh, when, uh, excuse me, that is uh, when they are treated with antipsychotics, I should be saying there. And Bell's mania should be considered when a person presents as manic and delirious. So that's a, that's a consideration diagnostic consideration whenever you see those two symptoms in combination. So that just gives us a little bit of information about this. And before we launch into this, I want to get to know our guests a little bit more. So we've got Amy and Brittany here, and I'd like for you guys to just do a quick introduction of yourselves. I don't know if anybody told you, we always like to get an interesting fact from our guests uh, about themselves. So if you have that, at the ready, you're able, you can do that. If not, you can pass. I'll give you a pass because I don't know if anybody, if you were actually told about that. Um, I'm Amy. I've got twin girls at home and I've been with Gina for seven years now. Okay. Well, so twins at home, that's a, that's a pretty significant, pretty interesting fact, I think, about you. So uh, thank you for sharing that. And you're a direct support professional, correct? Yes. And Brittany? Um, my name's Brittany. I work as uh, Gina's health coordinator with the agency, and I'm pretty boring, so I don't have an interesting fact for you. But I'm sure you do somewhere down there. If you think of one before we finish, you can just jump in and share your interesting <laughs> fact. Um, okay, well, I uh, appreciate you guys being here, and so I'm going to just go through a few pieces of information, and I'm going to pause periodically, and we'll have a little bit of conversation about it, okay? So, I, and correct me if I got anything wrong, because I'm just taking this information from reports that were sent here, and I, it's possible that in this quick time frame I got some things wrong. So please feel free to correct anything that I might. Have said. Well, well, Bruce, it's Victor. I, I'm going to interrupt just just yeah, quickly. Jump in, please. There's more folks in the room than than just the two that introduced themselves. So, uh, well, there's Katie Powers. She's there as well. All right, and Gina's in the room, isn't she? She was, but I think she has left at this point. Okay, I just wanted to make sure I, I knew who, who, who was all there. Thanks. All right, so Katie, you didn't get to introduce yourself because you were out of the room. Uh, you want to introduce yourself real quick and give your uh, uh, fun fact about yourself? A well, fun fact? <laughs> Is there anything fun? No. Um, yes, I've been here for, I've been in the field for 36 years. I'm the associate executive director here. And I love what I do. So that's my fun fact. <laughs> well, that's well known. Okay. So everybody knows that about you, that you really like what you do. But I'm glad to have you here today. Glad to have all three of you here today. So I'm going to just start talking a little bit about Gina's situation. So Gina is a 35-year-old Caucasian female. Uh, she was adopted at six months of age by an uncle. I, I, it was not 100% clear. It seemed relatively clear though that there was some abuse in her history um, and that that is part of uh, how she is came to where she is today. Um, genetic testing reveals a 15Q duplication syndrome. Now how many I, I'm wondering I'm just curious among our audience how many people have heard of that before? Uh, I am not familiar I was not familiar with 15Q duplication syndrome. Uh, but it does have a lot of implications for the things we're going to be talking about today because 
you know, people, uh, it, it can really affect what treatments are most effective for um, people who might experience Bell's mania or uh, bipolar disorder. Uh, developmental delays she experienced at age three. Uh, her adoptive parents divorced at age 15. And then at about that same time, some emotional and behavioral problems started to come up for her. And I don't know if there's anything more you guys would like to add to that brief history about her. Uh, is there anything more that you'd want to, to really point out and make sure that we know about? That's basically what we know. Um, okay. Before she came into our services, we did do PA service with her at her brother's home. Okay. So you've had a long history with her, even going back. So what I read, you started serving her in 2013. Right. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Which she would have been about age, uh, well, nine years uh, from 35, be 26 years old. Mm -hmm. Okay. Dr. Shuler, do you want to add anything else at this juncture? Well, I, it, first of all, I, I'll just introduce myself. Uh, I'm Victor Schuler. Uh, I'm a psychiatrist for our department, and I kind of work in a variety of roles. Uh, my title is Director of Psychiatry, which is kind of a euphemistic statement because I'm the only one in that department. So I guess I'm, I'm just the director of myself. He, but, he directs uh, himself. That is, yeah, uh, that's a, not, a major accomplishment, though. Yeah, no, yeah, I don't. Well, it would be if I did it well, but I don't. Um, I, you know, I mean, I've had a, a chance to uh, uh, review Gina's history. Bruce sent it to me last night, so uh, I, I've only been aware of it a short period of time. Uh, and I mean, I could say, quite honestly, I had never heard of Duke 15Q syndrome. Uh, and, uh, I think that, um, you know, in, in reading all of the information in the history, which I, I guess somehow we'll bring out today, Bruce, is that there, there are pockets of really good information out there, but it doesn't seem to, to all be connected real well. And, and I can tell you, I mean, we've made tremendous advances in medicine over the years, including being able to isolate three genes out to state that she has a 15Q11-Q13 duplication syndrome. Okay, that's a wonderful advancement in medicine. But what we haven't advanced in is communicating amongst ourselves. That has got a whole lot worse since the days of, you know, Marcus Welby and people sitting around, uh, you know, I mean, we used to have in hospitals uh, lunch rooms, which were quite nice. You know, they they had fine china, and 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 doctors would would have lunch there, and everyone thought that was just such a, you know, kind of an elitist thing. But one of the purposes was you sit around and you talk. I mean, you would talk about cases, you would discuss things, you would learn from one another, you would see the neurologist that you just referred someone to as a psychiatrist, and maybe across the room is the endocrinologist. So, uh, you know, that sort of communication is, I think, what we ought to focus on today, how, how we can help with that, to take a case or a situation that is, is, is complicated where every specialist has their own idea, but somehow it doesn't get put together to help the person. So uh, how we can draw that out, Bruce, I'll, I'll leave it up to you. My job is just to kind of jump in every once in a while. Yeah, but I think you're hitting on a very important theme, which is this is an inter it's it's going to take an interdisciplinary team to uh, help with this situation, and so as a result of that, we got to get everybody communicating and ensure that everybody who's involved in the treatment has all the information. And uh, Dr. Schiller, I wanted to say that I don't know who Marcus Welby is, but I'm afraid I'm going to have to own up to knowing who that yeah, is. Yeah, you know, uh, Marcus Welby was a TV doctor of the 70s. My interesting fact is I, I still watch shows of the 70s, Kojak being my favorite show right now. So, uh, 
Yeah. Any of y'all tell us? Yeah. Tell you some violence. Um, but. Right. Yeah. Go ahead, yeah. Bruce. Yeah. No, I'm talking about, I was talking about Marcus Welby, but uh, Kojak, yeah. Uh, that was uh, Tell us some Next slide. All right, so the historical diagnoses. Now, she had a long list of historical diagnoses, and I didn't even include all of them on here because uh, schizophrenia and um, there was another diagnosis that was listed, and I'm, it's escaping me at the moment, but it was also on there. Uh, but she has onchiomycosis, onchio uh, seasonal allergies, chronic back pain, leukopenia, thrombocytopenia, GERD, astigmatism, catatonia, insomnia, bipolar 1 disorder, and autism spectrum disorder. Um, she also had the diagnosis of schizophrenia listed. So these are uh, some of the conditions that she's been experiencing. Is there any of these that you want to comment on at all, Amy, uh, in particular? I, I'd be particularly interested if any of these uh, more or less physical or medical diagnoses seem to have any impact on how she responds um, you know, from a mental health perspective. So in other words, are, are any of the symptoms she's experiencing related to any of these chronic conditions that she has? Um, I don't think so. No, we don't think so. Okay, okay. So she, you don't think any of these medical conditions are contributing to uh, her, like GERD, is not contributing to any of the problems she's having currently. Seasonal allergies, any of these things. We're just trying to rule out whether there's a medical cause underlying any of these. We did ask our, her, her um, PCP to make sure that she looked at all those things. And we, so we, before we went to Susan's all, the last time. Okay. All right. Very good. Dr. Schuler, you want to add anything or have any additional questions here? Yeah, yeah, actually I do. I mean, the main diagnosis that actually does contribute to a lot of her problems is the 15Q11, Q13 duplication syndrome. So that really should be the first thing on any list of her current. I, I don't know if you're just going historical, but uh, she has this genetic syndrome that leads to different things we call phenotypes. So you have this genotype, which is the way your genes are put together, leading to a phenotype, which are the expressions of the gene. And there are certain things that she has medically that, that would be related to this genetic condition. One of them I don't see on there is dysphagia. Uh, she does have problems swallowing, doesn't she? And y'all have a, a certain mealtime guideline and, and part of the phenotype of the genotype of the Duke 15 q is that you have hypotonia of your muscles. So you have weakness and weakness can happen. You know, we tend to think about it in, in uh, the muscles of your arm, but it also happens in the muscles of your throat. So I think that's probably a cause for some of her uh, dysphagia, which also leads to being a cause from her uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease because the smooth muscle is going to be weak. Uh, Dr. Vaught has um, noted that the bipolar disorder is secondary to the genetic disorder. So she's, she's actually changed that diagnosis She's kind of done it out there on an island because she wrote it on her report, but I, I don't know if that's been universally accepted. The um, autism spectrum disorder is secondary to, to the uh, uh, genotype that, that she has. So, um, uh, but I just wanted to mention those. Additionally, another medical diagnosis, and again, I, I just, this, kind of coming out of my memory of what I've read. So if I'm incorrect, please tell me. But um, one of them is orthostatic hypotension. Orthostatic hypotension is when your blood pressure drops when you stand up. That's called orthostasis, also called dizziness in some folks. And she is taking a, 
a steroid for that uh, fludrocortisone, and that was recently increased. So I think the, you know, does she really have orthostatic hypotension or does she have autonomic instability secondary to catatonia? I know that's getting real complicated, but it ends up with her being on a steroid that was just increased. And what do steroids do? Well, they cause people to be irritable uh, and cause some people to be psychotic. So uh, I think, you know, getting a, and this is why this is so complicated is that all of these medical diagnoses uh, may not directly uh, like the orthostatic hypotension might not directly cause some psychiatric difficulties but the treatment of it could potentially cause that so anyway those were just some things that i also noticed in her medical diagnoses now, with that, I'm going to go ahead. I'm not listing every medication, but I do have some of the medications that she's taking listed here. So she's uh, taking Lamotrigine or Lamictal. She's taking Sertraline, or, or the brand name is Zoma. Uh, she's taking Olanzapine. Uh, uh, brand name is Zyprexa. And she's taking Lorazepam, brand name Ativan. Uh, and then you mentioned, Dr. Sheila, the fludrocortisone that she's taking, uh, as well as the fact, I believe I'm correct, that she has had ECT before as well. Can, you, just, can you all tell us a little bit about the course of her ECT? When was the last time she had it? What was her response to that? And, um, you know, any other information you can give us about the electroconvulsive shock therapy that she received? She's had it twice. Um, she the most recent time was the end of September, first of October, of this year, and then she also had it last year when uh, she was in Vanderbilt. COVID. Yeah, after having COVID and when she was being treated for the catatonia, um, really she didn't start pulling out of the catatonia until they began the ECT therapy. Okay. I was going weekly and there was no change at all until they began the ECT. So, but she's only had two treatments of that. Two, no. well, well, they did, I don't know. I, we're talking about that she's had treatments but for the, they were for a number of days each uh, other. Okay, so she, she would go and she would get a sequence of days how how many do you know remember approximately or exactly how many days they did um they did most of them in the hospital so we're not sure exactly how many there were um i did take her to two after she was released from vanderbilt last year she had two outpatient but all the rest were inpatient i think she had the maximum of 12 treatments this last time at vanderbilt because they kept her longer to do it at the hospital Okay. And how long ago was that again? That was 21? This was just this year, 22. Oh, it was, okay. Uh, six months ago? No, just a few months. No, September and October of this oh, year. More recent. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then since that time, what has been her response to that? Maybe describe a little bit about how she's responded. As far as the catatonia symptoms, they've gotten better. I've not noticed any of those, but her behaviors have escalated a whole lot more. She's becoming way more verbally and physically aggressive. Now, one of the questions I had, because I reviewed a number of antecedent behavior consequence records that you guys sent forth, um, and you've done a great job of describing a lot of things in those, by the way, Amy, that was excellent uh, description that you, you'd given of some of those uh, things that were occurring. But one of the things I noticed was that there, they were not occurring every day or there were not, they were not documented incidents every day. Um, is that accurate or it maybe was there, uh, it's a relative sort of thing? You know, I'm just curious as to what, it's What's happening every day, just some staff are not documenting. Okay, okay. 
So, so this is pretty much a continuous thing. That's what I'm, I'm trying to understand is that, that you're dealing with this on an ongoing basis. It's, there are, there, you know, there would be three or four days in between some of these incidents, but that's what you're saying is still happening. People just aren't writing it down every time. Correct. Okay. I understand that. All right. Dr. Shuler, you want to ask any additional questions about any of those things? Yeah, I just, you know, uh, um, I, I noticed Janet Schaus put a chat very early. Can somebody put those conditions in plain language? Uh, so, I, I mean, I want to make sure that I kind of try to do that. You know, first of all, I just want to discuss electroconvulsive therapy a little bit, uh, just for, for the wider group, people that don't um, uh, know much about it or only learned about it through infamous movies like One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, which will uh, really date folks uh, if they know that movie, but uh, it changed the course of how we treat people. Um, electroconvulsive therapy is uh, uh, probably the safest and the most effective way to treat severe depressions and catatonia. Catatonia being when somebody is uh, very still, very stiff, not wanting to uh, eat. Sometimes they become so stiff or they lack movement where they have medical problems like bed sores or even muscle breakdown from being so, so, so it's a very serious condition that has a lot of medical uh, consequences up to including death and depression also does. So in these serious cases, we can use electroconvulsive therapy, which is done by, first of all, putting someone completely to sleep with anesthesia and then applying a little bit of electricity through some pads to the forehead. And that causes a seizure. Um, that seizure somehow helps someone. We don't really know how that does, how it really works, uh, which is, you know, embarrassing, but you have to go ahead and admit that but it does help people with severe catatonia or depression. So you typically give this treatment every other day for six or 12 treatments. So we'll call those treatments a series. Okay, so it sounds like she has had two series of electroconvulsive therapy treatments. So again, I wanna say it is a very safe, very effective treatment. It is also incredibly important to pick the right patients. It is not a panacea. It is not a treatment to do when you are just frustrated because someone's not getting better. And I'm seeing more and more of that because it is a very lucrative treatment. So in her specific condition, this particular uh, genetic syndrome that she has, if you read what Dr. Vaught has written about it, who saw her in consultation, when she has catatonia, ECT for her condition is the most appropriate treatment. Actually, she states that antipsychotics are not. Uh, and, and she is on antipsychotics right now, and they were actually just increased. But I want, my question about the ECT is the first series that was last year, was that specifically given for catatonia? Yes. Okay, you said, and it helped. So the second series that she had uh, three months ago, was that given for catatonia? Yes. And it helped the catatonia? Yes. Okay, so- and it helped the first time? Yes, yes. So, so she got over it. Did she have these same symptoms when she got over it the first time? Um, not as bad. You know, after the first time, she was doing really well for a while, and then she started presenting with the symptoms again this year. I see. Now, last time uh, they did electroconvulsive therapy, at least you said a couple treatments. This is the first series. They did a couple outpatient treatments. So, uh, you know, you kind of call that a couple more for the road. And uh, there's a very, you know, very effective way of continuing to treat somebody. Some folks go and, and, and get that treatment once a month for a very long time. This time, 
didn't sound like they did that. I will tell you why. Um, first of all, I wanted to also tell you that Dr. Jerry Fitzpatrick, who's a psychiatrist too, that I know I called her about this too, um, to ask her and she's told me to go to Vanderbilt, which we did. And but this time they did the maximum of treatments, but um, he continuously, the doctors continuously remind me, and we've had several other people that have had the treatments too, that it's, it doesn't end, you have to come back periodically for it. So last week, I believe it was last week, Amy, we okay. took her back to Vanderbilt because one of the new doctor, Dr. Dreyfus said, um, maybe you need to take her back and you need to get ECT going again. So we did take her back last week and you go from there, Amy. Last week, they kept her in the assessment for two, like a day and a half. And they said they felt everything was more behavioral this time and ended up discharging her. No, they did change her medications. Yeah. They increased her olanzapine then, but that was the only change they made. I, I think they also, did they just start the lamictal? That's Lamotrigine, which is a medicine for mood. We had done that the week before. Two weeks ago. Okay. The one, the, one, the one thing I say about, you know, starting Lamotrigine, she, she's on a very low dose, but they wrote the order, and I, I read it in your MAR, that says you can increase it if needed. We are allowed yeah. to do that. I know, that's what I'm saying. That's what, what does that mean? You can increase it to what? And if needed for what? It's it's so so you ended up with a starting dose with somebody telling you that you can go ahead and just be the doctor and figure out how to increase it without giving you any specific instructions. And that makes it very, very uh, uh, confusing for you. And also that's not the way we can dispense medications in our, in our department for good reason. Our department, that's what we have to explain to every single doctor that's not in our department, that we are not allowed to do that. Yeah, it's, you know, I, I can tell you, uh, I'm, I'm sitting here in Texas right now. My dad's 90. I come down for his doctor's appointments mm -hmm. because I need to speak for him and ask questions and direct questions. Otherwise, it doesn't get done. Unfortunately, that is the exact same role that, that, that y'all are in as DSPs of uh, helping direct care. So uh, they need to understand these things. Sometimes it's hard to get it across. Part of what makes that confusing though is the doctor would still have to write an order for the increased dosage, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. So, you, so ultimately, even if you do that, you're still gonna have to get an order for it. Yeah, and give you a dose to what to increase it to. So yeah, it's a very awkward dose, but Anybody who goes through the medical profession right now, we're all fighting between us, the doctor and the pharmacist and your spouse trying to figure out what you're supposed to do. Uh, but it's just so much worse when you're in a crisis situation. Yeah. And getting these parties to talk to one another is such a, a big part of it, but uh, such so difficult to do at times. Next slide, uh, Babs. Uh, just a little bit about Gina's mental status. Uh, Amy, you described what she was like a little bit before, but these were some of the things that were listed by Dr. Bott in her report. Agitation, hyperactivity, flight of ideas, hyperverbosity, meaning she talks a lot, uh, pressured speech, meaning her speech is coming out very quickly and, and coming out almost as if it's being pushed out, uh, distractibility, and, and I put in quotations her description of her as unredirectable because that's often a term I'll use to say that somebody's in a pretty severe uh, psychiatric state is that you can't really get them redirected for any period of time. It it's just continues no matter how hard you try to get them moved in a positive direction that it, it, uh, it keeps coming back essentially. Um, is there anything Amy or uh, Brittany Katie, you want to add to that uh, mental status discussion no, there? Susan saw her, she was at her best. She saw her at her best because she was she was not necessarily, I wouldn't classify it as a good day, 
based on her observations, but you're saying that that was saying, as bad as it was, that was actually her best day. Her best day, uh-huh. Dr. Shuler, anything you want to discuss here or add? I can just say I was reading Amy's descriptions of what she sang throughout the day, which were excellent. And um, I once had a, a manic bipolar patient who wrote a book and uh, gave me a copy of the book and it read exactly like Amy's descriptions. It's just flight of ideas. Things don't make sense. They're all just put together all, almost funny at times and, and weird little puns and different things. So your descriptions of uh, um, what, you know, what she is saying is very helpful to a doctor, even if we're seeing someone on their best day, they need to know what their other days are like. And obviously Dr. Vaught, who I guess the group doesn't know who she is, but she's an excellent neuropsychologist. Uh, and uh, so Dr. Vaught was able to use the descriptions that uh, Amy and others had written down to be able to come up with her hypothesis, despite the fact that she had a better day that day. I, yeah, one of the things I really liked about your notes was the thought where you included the content of the thoughts that she was having, because it may it may be random, it may be completely out of the realm of, you know, anything that we would think is sensible. But at times we do find that some of those things connect and it may give you more information about the person's trauma history or, you know, other things that are going on with them. So it's very good to include that information, even if it doesn't ultimately result in a different diagnosis. Uh, next slide. So Dr. Vaught's final diagnostic impressions in her report, I think, are pretty meaningful. And, and uh, you know, I, I wouldn't have any reason to disagree with these at this point. It, it, it seems pretty consistent. She had bipolar 1 disorder due to 15Q11, 13Q duplication syndrome with mixed features, meaning depression and uh, mania, essentially. Uh, autism a spectrum disorder associated with the same duplication syndrome and then intellectual disability moderate uh, was her, were her diagnoses in her report. Dr. Shuler, you want to add anything there? As you stated previously, this is uh, due to the 15Q du duplication syndrome in her. Yeah, report. it's just that, you know, the, the DSM-5, which is our um, big book of diagnoses uh, in psychiatry, does give you the ability to list a cause of the bipolar disorder. And I really, I, I've i never done that before. So this is a wonderful opportunity uh, uh, to do that. So there is a known cause. The, the one diagnosis that I don't see on there, which is the diagnosis seemingly being given to the staff is behaviors. Because you know, there is no diagnosis called behaviors. And, uh, we, we, you know, I know that's what the neurologist recently told you, and, and I guess the ER told you. Uh, I don't even know what that means, because you certainly, I mean, everyone has behaviors, and if her behaviors are secondary to these known diagnoses, then treat them, you know? I, you know, it's... It, we always argue about diagnoses, and I, there, I don't think there's much argument with these. They're, they're pretty no. clear. No, it's they what, are. And, you know, one of the things I want to make sure is clear to everybody, because, uh, yeah, I've heard before people say, like, uh, developmental disabilities, that, that mental health disorders don't co-occur with uh, uh, developmental disabilities or intellectual disability. Uh, this is clearly a case where it does. And it's a, it's a complicating factor to have autism spectrum disorder and bipolar disorder, but it does happen. And, you know, this is the kind of circumstance that we face when we deal with that. Um, I, it, it is a little bit curious to me that that people are looking at this as behavioral, because as I looked at this, as I reviewed this case, I did not come to that conclusion. Now, I don't know, Amy, Brittany, Katie, do you, uh, how do you feel about that aspect of it? Do you have any 
um, did it make sense to you when it was suggested that it was behavioral? Well, we didn't, I don't think any of us did until we met with Dr. Dreyfus and she wanted to start um, the DBT stuff with us. And I went back to Susan called me right after we met with her and she said, well, you can't do that right now because she's in a manic mood. She also, we also have to remember what Susan didn't put on there, but she usually does, that this young woman as a, as a little girl was uh, raped. And to me, that is very significant. Yeah. We, uh, we had to go to all kinds of therapies and nothing worked at all. But recently she told her own story for the first time, what happened to her. And she was very explicit, wasn't she? And um, she also has um, different personalities too. Um, how many personalities does she have, Amy? Um, I know of at least five. Some of them are male too. So, okay, well, that's that I, it, trauma was mentioned in the report, but the specific nature of it was not uh, revealed. So that's that's uh, important information, and that's not exactly reflected in these diagnoses. Uh, you know, so there's no post-traumatic stress disorder diagnosis. There's no uh, uh, other diagnoses diagnosis that would reflect uh, the the trauma that she's experienced. Susan had us take us to um, we we went to Virginia to have her do art therapy to hope that would bring some of it out when she first came to us. This young woman too, when she was in a, in our personal assistance with her, they would lock her in a closet, uh. and they would call say because of her behaviors, and. Um, that's why she finally came with us because they were locking her in a closet and wouldn't let her out. Well, you, you said that you know recently it was the first time that she told her story and she was somewhat explicit. And I understand what you meant by that, but I think in, she's been telling the story for a long time. It just hasn't been as explicit and under and understandable. If you look in, if you look at the themes of her kind of pressured speech is very dark and accusatory and talks about being beaten. And, and Amy is, you know, and others have done such a good job writing that out. So, you know, I'm kind of reading it from that perspective. And, and you can, you know, why is she going all these dark themes and uh, making allegations? I mean, I think it is all related uh the thematic portion is all related to her past trauma. So she, yeah, she definitely should have a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, and I, Dr. Bach probably just, I, I know she realized that and just didn't add it. She did make but, a recommendation regarding trauma-informed yeah. care. Yeah. Uh, so, so she recognized that uh, influence. She just didn't include a diagnosis for that. Yeah, and th so that's the mix of uh, the mania which is a psychiatric medical condition in my mind, but then how the, the past trauma affects her and those mingle together, making it uh, really hard to treat. But I think what Dr. Vaught was saying was that at this time, she's currently manic. Manic with push to speech, punning. I, I guess she's probably not sleeping well, that would be my guess, but. She's not okay. So she's manic, and, and when you're manic, it is pretty hard for a uh, a working therapy like DBT, where you have to work and concentrate on things, to take hold right now. Well, that's what she suggested because I had the Julie Brown thing, and I, I went back, and Susan and I talked about it quite a bit. Um, Susan's wonderful. She calls me every week to see how she's doing, um, but we just we don't seem to move forward. The other thing is Jessica is extremely smart. She went all the way through high school and did very well in high school, very well. And she can sit and if you ask her to write something, she can, her spelling's probably better than mine. And she can write very well for you. She can also sing like no one I ever have heard anybody sing. She can sing songs and she can remember every single word of the song yeah. before she sings it. 
Yeah, I noted that she does have some echolalia, uh, which is a symptom of autism spectrum disorder as well. And so uh, this, you know, this may be a, a reflection of that. Um, but uh, yeah, so I, I do want to get us on to the next slide because this is where we can talk about the action steps uh, that, and so uh, I'm not exactly reporting exactly what Dr. Uh, Bott recommended, but I thought that these were some next steps that we ought to be thinking about uh, as we move forward and make sure that we're communicating about as we move forward. And, and maybe we'll just kind of pause on each one here a little bit. Inpatient hospitalization was one of those concerns because of the manic nature of what she was doing or what was described uh, that, that it, you know, the thinking, I think, on Dr. Vaught's part and, and, and on my part, having talked to you a few times about this, Katie, was that, that we might need to pursue that. I do understand you took her back to Vanderbilt. Uh, what was the outcome of that? Huh. That's what they said. When she gets into a place like um, a hospital or to um, behavior respite, and I now have a son with autism, a uh. grandson, very young, and he has to have everything structured. Even at two years old, he does. But what I do notice when she goes in there, she knows exactly where she is, and all of a sudden she becomes this perfect angel. I mean, she turned it on from the first day. They said, oh, she's bad. So the next day, oh, she's been perfect. Perfect. So that's part of their reasoning behind uh, calling this behavioral because she comes into the hospital and she does well there. Yes. She still is distractible and irritable, though, when she's in the hospital, or is that, is that all go away? Well, the first, last Monday when I first took her, she was very irritable. She spit on me. She shoved me. She was holding her fist up to hit me. And then she was running behind the desk. She was grabbing food off their counters and they had to put it away. Um, she was talking about even the nurses beating her. I mean, just running through screaming and yelling. But then the next day, but they, Tuesday, Monday, the first day, they said, oh, we, she needs to be hospitalized. We just don't have a room. Yeah. And then come Tuesday, she was great. She laid there. She oh, barely no, talked. Same. I mean, she laid there and watched the movie. She did great until, so then they said they were going to discharge her. We barely got pulled out of the parking lot and she screamed and yelled the entire way home. She's also beginning to want to jump out of the van. Yeah, she keeps telling me she's going to, if I don't stop the vehicle and turn around, she's going to jump out. She's also told me if I don't stop the vehicle, she's going to throw me out and she hopes I die. Okay. So, well, I'm not adding diagnoses. This, I'm just kind of throwing this out as a consideration. So a lot of times when people have post-traumatic stress disorder, it uh, develops into a personality disorder called borderline personality disorder. Uh, and, uh, you know, part of the reason I bring that up is a lot of people with borderline personality disorder had the same response to going into a hospital or other structured setting. Uh, is that, the, you know, the symptoms seem to go away uh, sometimes for people when they're in that, that very structured locked setting like that or, or a very structured setting. So, um, you know, that that is yet again, I think, something else to think about here um, as it relates to, to responding to her. By the way, I wanted to bring up also, you mentioned the skill system which is Julie Brown's skill system is a DBT related uh, therapy for people with cognitive disabilities. And so this is designed for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Again, if she's too agitated, too manic at this point, to be able to benefit from that, that's not necessarily the treatment of choice at this moment, but uh, it certainly is something that may need to be addressed, especially if the trauma is having that great an impact um, on on how she's responding. And Dr. Shiller, you want to talk about these medication considerations? Well, I think we have 
four minutes left. So uh, I'm not sure how you want to wrap it up, but just some important things to look at is also the, the fluticortisone that she's on can, can cause uh, mood instability and uh, psychosis at times. I mean, it's a steroid. Doesn't have to, she's been on it for a while, but they also recently just increased that. So why is she on it? You know, what's the importance of it? Um, there was a, uh, she has a genetic condition. Vanderbilt has genetic experts, perhaps getting a Vanderbilt geneticist. Yes, ma'am, I, th I think we were gonna say something. Yeah, we, we've tried that in the past when Susan's asked us to do it and we, and she knows that we've had no luck with that at all. Well, wow. I mean, she has a rare, interesting genetic condition. I'm surprised that they don't want to. Uh, uh, you know, I, I think that's something to, to look into. But the main thing is, you know, Dr. Voss report is excellent. It is both a teaching tool and a tool uh, to uh, um, help her other clinicians. My question is, do they have that report? Have they read it? Has Dr. Vaught called them? You know, yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. This is our, our whole problem. We don't have a provider. Yeah. We sent the port, report to Dr. Dreisner. Dr. Dreisner read the report before we met with her. But then Dr. Dreisner explained to me well, how did she put it? They're more an advocate yeah. for services. Well, I didn't know that. Yeah. So that's why I came back. Um, and we have a uh, nurse practitioner with Team Health, which was the psychiatric team. And um, we gave her Susan's report, her recommendations for the medications, and she wouldn't do anything. So now we're out looking, and I've been very, I'm trying to now get in touch with. Dr. Jerry Fitzpatrick, because I know that we can pay her if we have to, if she will just see her. I don't, because she doesn't take insurance at all. So all right. I'm trying to get a hold of Jerry, but our whole concern here is that we don't, I'm gonna cry. We have, I have been looking for a provider for her, Bruce can tell you for many, yeah. many years, and I can't find a provider. A psychiatrist is what I'm trying to say. Well, I was hoping that Vanderbilt has a psychiatry department and outpatient psychiatrist. They got center stone. Well, that's not a psychiatrist, I can tell you. Okay. Well, one more suggestion. Uh, we do have the the START team. It's a service that DID has uh, in which um, we can help in many different ways, but one of the ways is communication. Uh, in going to appointments. Um, I'm the medical director of the STAR team, so I can kind of lead some of the direction, not in a in a care manner, but in 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 helping uh, the, the STAR facilitators go to appointments and try to build that communication. Have you all considered a referral for that service? Bruce and I talked about it. We do have two people in our START program now, and, um, and I did say we would look at that after we did today. Um, Again, I'm, I think they're wonderful. One of them is just wonderful. He comes in emergencies, does very, very well. But what we find and when we go to doctor's offices and when Susan Vault's report's not taken with any kind of, oh, they didn't even care about the report. I wonder what anybody else is going to be able to do. I mean- Well, I, I, I do think that we've got to, uh, get get them get somebody who will actually accept the report and also talk to somebody about it because this is uh it's critical and actually i thought that was what was going to happen with life connect but i didn't realize they were not providing the psychiatric service yeah. as part of what they i did do. call them back this so, week but i didn't get a response at all from them um i think i think we definitely need to try to get you connected with somebody but but it and it may require going the extra mile, especially in this case though, to actually make a phone call and to try to connect the parties. So because a lot of times I think, especially in a brief appointment, 
somebody doesn't want to uh, read a whole report, uh, it's it, it's maybe a little bit inconvenient. And so, you know, as a result, I think a lot of times the information I get passed along. I've, I've learned, one of the things I've learned as I've gotten older is that a lot, a lot can be accomplished in a phone call, in a conversation. Um, and so I might encourage that if we can, if it can be facilitated in some manner. Yeah, I think uh, we're all for that. And, and like I said, Susan and I have just known each other forever. So I have that with her at all times, but she's right. not here. I just told her last week, I'll drive her there. You know, if she can just see you. Yeah. Um, because I'm so, um, we, we have tried to go to the mountaintop, but I just see, just keep falling or I keep falling off because I can't except I have it. Um, I'm going to stop by Jerry's or call her and see if she'll do it and we'll pay her. Um, well, that, that, that'd be great if we can accomplish that, that would, uh, that would address this problem. I'd certainly like to see us be able to solve it more systemically. Uh, and so over time, I hope we'll be able to do that. I actually do think it'd be a very good idea for you to get connected with Star. It, Partly because, and, and Dr. Vaught pointed out in her report that crisis planning was really an important thing now. You, it seems like you've got everything you need to have in place from a behavioral perspective. Uh, the, she, she indicates the behavior plan is good during periods when she's able to, to respond in a typical manner. Uh, it just hasn't worked that well lately. And so there's a lot more perhaps at this point that he's been done around crisis planning, which is the thing that START helps with. Uh, so I I'll, encourage that. I will do that. I just, um, and, her, and I did get in touch with her conservator and we talk all the time, but he'll just talk to me to make sure I told him about today and he would agree to that too. Um, yeah. I think I've also got a worn out staff. And yeah. You have a BA that comes in and she's a good BA. I want to say that. Okay. She's a good BA, but um, they're worn out because she never ever stops for a minute. She doesn't. And now she's also urinating in her bed, which she's never done before. Well, what you gotta do here, I mean, and I understand how tough it is. So I, I don't want this to come across the wrong way, but you, you have to kind of stepwise work your way through these recommendations and they're not easy to accomplish because of some of the factors the barriers that we've been just talking about but that's the key to getting this going in a different direction is is just kind of stepwise diligently following through on these recommendations some of them may work some of them may not work but we've got to try them in order for them to to have their chance and uh and then we see where it goes from there Strategies for autism spectrum disorder can't be ignored. So structured routine with something you're finding is working. Maybe trying to get more going in that regard could help her feel more comfortable and, and feel, feel more like participating and then follow up with Vanderbilt genetics if that's something that they can do um, to, to check and see if they have any additional recommendations, you know, this, this far down the road. Uh, Dr. Shuler, I'll give it over to you to see if you have any closing comments you want to make. I wish we could get everybody's comments in the chat because a lot of people are commenting on everything, uh, but we've run out of time. Yeah, no, I mean, I can make closing comments for another hour. I, I did note that you just, she just mentioned that she started urinating in her bed. Urinating in bed can be a sign of autonomic instability the autonomic nervous system which goes along with delirium and catatonia the the sort of things that uh dr vaught was uh was mentioning so uh it, it does seem like with. it's going to take some work just to get it which is not uncommon in our work uh, our field to get the other people to understand what's going on here <laughs> uh it's it's not always easy to do uh, but uh, to the extent that we can help, we certainly want to do this uh, and, and to help uh, in any way that we can. And I, I want to make sure you get connected with a, a psychiatrist who will be responsive as well. Um, I appreciate so much you guys coming on and sharing this information. Uh, I, I think it's been very helpful to our audience to 
kind of uh, have this discussion. A lot of people may not have ever experienced uh, 15Q duplication syndrome or Bell's mania or, uh, you know, uh, uh, bipolar disorder uh, as a result of all that, autism spectrum disorder, very interesting uh, scenario that you have brought to us. So thank you so much for coming on and, and talking with us about it today. Thank you. And thank all of you, our audience, for being here. And uh, we will see you again next week on the Clinical Consultation Network. We do it every Tuesday at 1230. We'll see you then. Bye-bye.